welcome to Slick Rock. I'm Janica Dunbar. Southeastern Utah is a mecca for all kinds of outdoor sports. People come from all over the world to play in the sun, sand, and on the red rocks. Things come alive here every year in late March to early April. It's spring break in Moab, Utah. Crowds gather for the yearly madness of guys and their machines. What's up, man? The girls are along for the ride. Potato Salad Hill is a magnet for hundreds on the lookout for bargain thrills. It got the name some years ago when someone's picnic bowl of leftover potato salad bounced out of their truck, scattering all over the rock. Come on, they let us go. Why don't you want to go up again? Spectators enthusiastically cheer for those who brave the hill. My front axle fell apart, and then... The frenzy continues until something breaks. Truck. Something happened before that, though. Oh, I broke off this four-wheeler. And then I put the trailer under the truck. So... Pretty much if I go up that, my front axle will fall out, Ooh. and then I'll roll over like Ooh. eight times. Screams get more intense for those who don't make it. <laughs> Some passengers bail out just after the first attempt. The sport of four-wheeling is becoming more popular each year. In the last two decades, four-wheeled vehicles have become more sophisticated than ever. Regular trail-rated vehicles are no match for some steep inclines of slick rock. Challenges like Dump Bump and BFE, otherwise known as Big Freakin' Extreme, draw enthusiasts like bees to honey to watch the big boy toys perform. Wow, now that is just plain crazy. Coming up next, you'll see another way to enjoy motorized recreation. You don't want to miss it. <laughs> believe this? Around 2,000 four-wheel drive vehicles are lined up and ready for adventure. There are about 30 trails being driven today. This is the famous Moab Easter Jeep Safari at its best. The police block the traffic until everyone is out of town. Amazingly, this is done in about 30 minutes. You can see just about every kind of vehicle here at the Moab Jeep Safari. They come from all over the USA, and some even from Europe. Wow, I can really get into this. Let's find out what people are doing with these machines. But there is another moderately related sport that has been popular for years. It's the leisure of family recreational four-wheeling. It is fantastically beautiful. Their machines are meant to take on the challenge, but with another reason in mind. The goal with these folks is to get into the outback with their children and friends and access the rugged beauty that nature has to offer. Behind me is Hell Roaring Window. This awesome. one is great. Beautiful. I drive a 2007 uh, Wrangler Rubicon. I already damaged underneath it, only I had it five weeks, but. <laughs> so what? This is the no fun deal. of it. No big deal, you know? <laughs> but anyway, we, uh, we like it here and we expect to be back here many times.
I'm Jack, and this is Shirley Sheeler from Reno, Nevada. Uh, we're driving the CJ5 uh, Jeep. Having a great time. This is our first year here, and we'll be back again many times, for sure. It's absolutely breathtaking. A lot of fun, a lot of good people. Out west, last century mining and cattle wrangling created many thousands of miles of roads. Natural erosion has changed these routes into bumpy, challenging trails. The happy byproduct is four-wheeling fun. Accessing these roads are dirt bike motorcycles, all-terrain vehicles or ATVs, jeeps and trucks and everything in between. This recreational sensation has its origin from a vehicle invented for the U.S. military in 1941. Jeep became a popular overland mode of transportation in the war effort. Later, the term Jeep Road was commonly used in describing difficult routes on maps. No matter the brand of four-wheel drive vehicle, Jeeping soon became a popular term for this unique sport. From the beautiful southeastern desert of Utah to the dizzying alpine heights of southwestern Colorado, Jeepers are in for a real treat. But it was fun. And it was a blast, but it was scary. It can be a little intimidating for those who do this for the first time. It's a real rush. Up next, let's see what we have to do to get these rigs ready before hitting the trail so we can be safe but still have lots of fun. Stay tuned! Before getting on the Jeep road or trail, drivers prepare their rigs. Among those chores are airing down tires and removing the sway link disconnects. I like to air down this tire to about 12, maybe 13 pounds. And uh, that gives me a nice soft ride, but at the same time, it's not gonna, I'm not gonna lose the bead off the rim. It just protects the tire and it kinda gives more surface, more tire surface and it makes it uh, so that you can climb some of the slick rock we're going to do today. And so it's really, really critical that uh, we take the right amount of air out. And uh, people who are riding in the Jeeps really notice the difference when we take the air down. See, I'm down to 20 pounds already, just checking that. But this is a ritual we have to go through, you know, before we go on the trail. Soon, all four tires are down to a desired pressure. I'm going to take a uh, link off of our sway bar and I pull, pull that off. Now we're going to take this pin out on this side and then I use the screwdriver to pop it off and then I bring it up and I can put that in the post here like that. And the reason why we do this is because it allows more articulation to take place with our vehicle. The more that we can keep the tires on, on the surfaces, the more traction we're going to have. Even though we have four-wheel drive, we need to have uh, as much traction as we can. And that uh, allows us to get over some of the really rough places. We've got some rocks that are high and way low. And a normal Jeep or vehicle would go over the top of those things would spin out. It wouldn't, wouldn't work very good. Do you wonder what these machines are doing to the environment? Let's listen to both sides of the issue. You don't want to miss this debate, no matter what your point of view is. Over the decades, the use of off-highway vehicles or OHVs has become more popular people are enjoying different types of mechanized vehicles, including bicycles, to explore the beauty of public lands. This has led to ongoing controversy. Diverse accessibility rights of hikers, horseback riders, environmentalists, and OHV riders are clashing with each other. 
they are contending with who gets privileged use to the more popular places on public lands. Millions of dollars are spent every year by organizations on all sides of the issue. The land use matter has been debated locally, statewide, and on a national level. This is especially true in the western states, where the largest part of their territory is federally managed public lands. Managers of the Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service are caught in the squeeze. It comes down to ability, accessibility, and those who can convince with a stronger argument. You know, the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance was founded to advocate for the protection of the remaining wild lands in Utah. Um, these are public lands owned by all Americans, um, not just, you know, locals that live around them. And our mission is to preserve, or to work to have these preserved um, as wilderness um, for future generations to enjoy. Moab, I think, is such a wonderful spot to be because there's so many different recreational things you can do. We have hikers, we have jeepers, we have mountain bikers, we have river rafters, we have rock climbers, and they come out here and I think there's room for everybody. This isn't something that, you know, well, I'm a jeeper and so I'm the only one that can be here. But it's something that everybody can use this, and I really am a very firm advocate of multiple use, multiple use of the public lands. And if people will realize that we can all fit together out here, that we can all enjoy the public lands, then I think it'll take a lot of the controversy and a lot of the argument out of it the more power to them. I mean, you know, enjoy it. And I mean, I think our public lands are for everybody to enjoy. And I, I love it that people, you know, do come here. And I think it gets people more in invested in protecting a place if they can see the changes that have happened maybe year after year when they've come to one of their special places and it just gets more torn up each year. I think it, it might make them more likely to, to put a little pressure on other, you know, off-road vehicle users to to, to have a better ethic. I'm a member of the Utah Trail Patrol, and we have a uh, patrol here in Moab, and what we do is we go out and we take care of this land. We have about 15 or so members here in town locally. And I think last year we did somewhere in the range of almost 300 land use service hours. And we go out and we clean up trash, we mark trails. Um, one of the real popular trails out here, it's called Moab Rim. And the top of it was just bought a couple years ago by the Nature Conservancy. And so they came and were looking for vehicles that could go up there and help them dismantle a building on the top. Well, we as Jeepers volunteered because nobody else can get up to the top of the rim. We went up there, we helped them tear down the building, we helped them bring out stuff, we built up fences to keep people out of the private property because that's what I think is so needed in order to be able to keep this land open is to maintain the, the responsible use of that so that everybody can enjoy it. There's a few places that, that just are really inappropriate for off-road vehicle use on public lands. One of them is, is riparian areas. They provide, um, they provide water, you know, basically the lifeline for, you know, 80% of the wildlife in the area. Well, I think that's one of the things that's kind of the, the big centers of debate out here, especially, is how to use the land responsibly, but still maintain the ability to be able to keep it open. And if we're going out there, we're using the trails that exist. And I think that's one of the things that's very important is to be able to, to go out there and to use these trails, to maintain them, and to make sure that you're minimizing the amount of damage that's done. Once you drive off of a trail, you've made a new trail for the next person to follow. Those tracks don't go away. I don't advocate going out and just driving wherever you want because obviously that's going to tear up the land, that's going to destroy it, and that's not what we're about. We're not going to hurt it any as long as we're staying on the trail. Sue is not advocating that. There's no off-road vehicle use on public lands. Um, we're advocating that a few of the special places be protected so that, you know, cultural resources, wildlife, and, and other recreationists, you know, traditional recreationists that are going out to hike or bird watch or have a picnic with their family can go someplace and not hear and see off-road vehicles. In my mind, the Jeepers are really some of the true environmentalists because they're getting out there and they're using the land, but they're also taking care of the land. We go out and we mark the trails, we clean up the trails. And so to me, that's some of the best part about it is not only getting out and doing this stuff, but taking care of the land and really appreciating the fact that we have this land to be able to use. So I have a form of muscular dystrophy that affects the strength that I have in my legs and in my arms. And so the only way that I can get out and enjoy this scenery and see this beauty is in motorized recreation. I literally say that my Jeep is my legs, and without that, I wouldn't be able to get out and do all these type of things and see this beautiful scenery that is on public land.
Jay Speck has been physically active all of his life. After he injured his spinal cord in a hiking accident, he didn't let his paralysis get the best of him. While attending a therapy program in Utah, he found a way to continue his active lifestyle by jeeping. Well, I broke my neck two years ago in a rock climbing accident, and I, before that I went camping and hiking and all of that stuff, and uh, through the jeeping we've been able to get out and do pretty much the same things, get out here in the middle of nowhere basically and do the camping and get out and see all the nice scenery and mountains and everything, so it's just kind of opened up the life that I had before in the same way through the hiking and everything. All right, I have the hand controls here. And the way I drive, these, are, these bars are connected directly to the pedals. And to accelerate, I just push down. Jace and David are examples of how off-highway vehicles have helped individuals who are unable to hike to still enjoy our public lands. not going to believe where we are going next. It's going to rock your socks. This is one place though that I'm bailing out. Up next. We begin with an exciting ride to Gemini Bridges, a natural sandstone marvel not far from Canyonlands National Park's Island in the Sky. Driving a short distance past the Goonie Bird Rock, we follow a bumpy wash road through Bull Canyon. At the end is a tall red sandstone cliff box. After a short hike, we witness a captivating view of the bridges. It gives them a spectacular perspective of the twin spans before seeing them at the top. Returning, our group travels an easy road and arrives at the upper side of Bull Canyon. A short four-wheel drive from there leads us directly to the edge of these parallel wonders. Individuals peer over the edge into the 250-foot void they saw earlier from the bottom. Just lay down right here and then you scoot all the way. Okay. Our relationship well, built on okay. trust. Well, that's more. <laughs> what happens next is a rare, exhilarating experience in four-wheeling adventure. There are two remarkable choices to transverse the bridges. One is the inner and wider span. The other, a narrow path barely wide enough to accommodate a vehicle. Our Jeep follows a rocky road shelf leading right to the edge. After the thrill of driving the downward sharp left turn, we drive across the 10-foot wide span. This path is not for the lighthearted. Few passengers stay on board for this white knuckle ride. That was scary. <laughs> Isn't that a rat? Yep. How's that feel? <laughs> <laughs> a few yards from Gemini Bridges is a brass marker. It commemorates an accident that occurred a few years ago. An avid four wheeler lost his brakes and his life. Once again, it reminds us of the ever-present danger this rugged country poses to hikers, bikers, and jeepers. Unfortunately, his natural wonder is now closed to vehicles. Now you know why I bailed. These families really get into the challenge of these awesome obstacles. Before taking on the mighty Hell's Revenge Trail, a beginner may want to warm up on Little Lion's Back. It's a small
small distance from the Hell's Revenge trailhead, a moderate size sandstone fin. Don't let it fool you, because it is a thrill all its own. After the steep climb, the fin levels out on top. Drivers get a good feel of an uneven surface, the steepness on each side and how their vehicles respond to the environment. After driving about 40 yards, the fin slopes into a small lake. The water pools around the fin. It's rare, but sometimes it can get up to three feet deep. Driving through, the trail then leads us back to the beginning. Many try it a few times until they become familiar and more confident with the terrain. The Jeep trail you're about to ride along with us on is one of the most famous in the world. Steep climbs on the Red Rock Mountains give this trail a fitting name of Hell's Revenge. We're out here just running one of the Jeep trails today and uh, it's a beautiful day for it. A little overcast but it's nice and warm so uh, we're hoping we'll have a good time today. Driving back to the Hell's Revenge trailhead, we immediately begin an intimidating climb up a fin that is three times higher but half as wide as the little lion's back. It's white knuckle experience and a little intimidating. Our group ascends down the other side into a little valley of large sandstone fins. Water's usually found here, sometimes it's more abundant. By some, the name for this odd but persistent feature is Lake Michigan, but there's not much water today. We pass by the famous lion's back. It's a granddaddy of fins. It is no longer accessible to vehicles. Old footage shows the massive size of this daunting fin. It was also once popular to daredevil motorcycle riders. It later became a challenge to ATV riders. We have a place here where we have a couple of crosses. There's one here and one over there. A couple individuals were in a, in a vehicle and uh, unfortunately they lost their lives coming off the lion's back which is quite a ways up here. It kind of goes to show that there is a, a, a real hazard doing this kind of sport and don't have your wits about you. If you've been drinking or something like that you could lose your life and so it's so critical that you know what you're doing. We are soon challenged by supersized hills of petrified dunes, many stories high. It's amazing how our vehicle's rubber tires grip to the inclined slick rock sandstone surface. The incline is as steep as 40 degrees in places. It's like a roller coaster except without the security of knowing that you're strapped in and uh, stuck to the track. Twists and turns confront us along the way. And we just came down uh, some pretty, pretty decent slick rock, so we should have a pretty good day today. Just like a slow-moving roller coaster, we ride up and then down these huge monoliths. Right, it's really spooky is up there where you don't know where you're going. Yes. That's where it's spooky. Yeah. This is our first time in 18 years that we've been on Hell's Revenge, but uh, we've got our, our families got bigger, and now we've got sons that bring their friends. We've got our cousin that brought us down here in 1988. We started coming down here. Now we've got my grandson, my granddaughter here, and so we've really enjoyed it through here through the years. I like coming back every year. It's been a good family outing. We finally come to the other side where vehicles negotiate an undulating sandstone road. Hey, we got a can of tuna fish and wheat then. We'll make you a sandwich with that. How's that, Tom? Heading for our lunch spot, the trail flattens out on the plateau. The one that looks like an L is left. The safari comes to a dead end where we stop to enjoy lunch. Some play on the rocks while others treat themselves to a spectacular view of the Colorado River. We have come all this way to see such a spectacular view and take a break for lunch. Close by is an optional rock to play on, known as 
Hell's Gate. If you dare take the challenge, you're in for a ride that matches its name. See that little dish right there? As you come up on it, you don't want to stay straddle of the, of the gully. What you want to do is you want to crank it to the left and get over a little bit. An experienced driver explains to others how to negotiate the steep walled wedge. You move your back end about 10 or 12 inches over. Going up this daunting climb is only part of it. First, vehicles must drive down at another location, which is just as steep and frightening. It gets your heart pumping and racing. It's then time to ascend the other menacing side. Maneuvering the steep wedge is risky, even for a skilled driver. It never hurts to have another person acting as a spotter. One can't be too careful, as explained by Marlon, a seasoned wheeler. That was kind of an interesting experience. Uh, went up with a thing called Hell's Gate. Did it before, and it didn't have any problem at all, but made a little error and got too high on one side. Consequently, I went on my side. Right there. Shit. A little bit scary because if you've seen anything on YouTube, you know that people have a tendency to roll all the way down. And uh, I figured I was going to be rolling all the way down, but it stopped, and I was happy about that. I was thinking any minute I'm going to roll down that, that hill. That was really scary. So once again, we talk about when you're doing this type of stuff, you have to be really careful. Even the guy that uh, tells you to be careful had an accident. See what I mean? This is a very popular trail. The way in is the way back out, but the view on the way out is like a brand new trail. As we continue along the trail, we enjoy a series of slick rock hills and sandy bottoms. Interesting obstacles are enjoyed along the way. We negotiate a narrow bridge with drop-offs on either side. The group follows each other over a shelf that is close to 45 degrees. The sound of barking tires and revving of engines define each vehicle. This has got to be a Disneyland type ride made just for Jeeps. Soon we come to the joy of the car wash. Some find it fun to do this feature over and over again. Even with moisture wetting the slick rock, our vehicles climb with ease. Close by is a large sandstone pothole called a hot tub by the locals. We're standing here at the uh, hot tub waiting to see if anybody will actually take the uh, challenge to go up, but it doesn't look like anybody's willing to take it except the dog, of course. Well, yeah, many years ago we uh, drove by here and I always thought that if you missed the corner and you oh, yeah. fell in there, you'd never get out. Then one day after going through here with some friends, uh, we came back to this to play around. And First thing we did, we backed in there with the aid of a winch, thinking that we would actually go over backwards, possibly. Backed in and pulled out, and we did that, and that was pretty cool, we thought, you know, made good pictures. So I came around, and I drove in the steep side and drove out this other side over here. I thought that was pretty cool. Then not to be outdone, a good friend of mine, Texas Bob, who's deceased now, he went in the shallow side and drove up the wall that way. I think he's probably one of the first guys to go up that one. Uh, at that time, I was using the CB handle Mickey Mouse, so they called it Mickey's Hot Tub after Dan Mick but uh, probably one of the first hot tubs around here to have uh, some use and some fun. It's been a lot of fun. A lot of people have had great times here and there's been many vehicles damaged right there. Uh, they've spent a lot of money in this hole over the years. You can see this Hummer over here behind us is right now doing a little repair work after uh, 
biting the dust inside of the hole. And here's our Hummer driver right here. He's from Israel, now living in New York, New Jersey area. Hi. Was it good That's for you? It was great. Was it worth the break? Absolutely. No problem? Ready to do no. it again as Susie fix it? No problem again. No problem. You do, do it again. Uh, same piece of cake. A lot of fun. One time we're going up Wipeout Hill and he's talking about, here we are. Uh, going up Wipeout Hill with Dan Mick and oh shit, he said as it went on up the hill. <laughs> you know? He, you know, did that scare you? Yeah, it scared me a little bit, but I was out to have fun, you know? Don't have fun unless you're out scaring people just a little bit. Gotta be safe though at all times. Not far is another steep fin. The fun here is going off the top without seeing where you're going. This is pretty interesting because you, you come up to the edge and you can't see anything except the people down at the bottom. You're not sure what it does and you start coming over. It's a little intimidating. We did it. Boy. It's a scream. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> For added fun, some undertake the climb back up. The fin was really neat. I really enjoyed like just going straight down. My little brothers were in the back seat and they just loved seeing, being able to see things, being in the back seat. You can't always see over the hood with them. And they're small, so they're just like, this is sweet, because they get to see everything. And it was, it was just fun, I really enjoy it. If you haven't had enough excitement for one day, along comes Tip Over Challenge. Dan Mick, a local trail guide, makes it look easy. The challenge, called Tip Over Challenge, is as scary as the name implies. Luckily, it's optional. Some of our group chooses to go around. There we go, okay. He's got it right. Okay, very good, very good. There is an obvious reason for this obstacle's name. One last barrier finishes out the trail. It has some tight squeezes. It's called the shoot. It's not only off camber, but also gives new meaning to the adage between a rock and a hard place. As we drive past the other side of Lion's Back, we finish the trail with a fabulous view of the LaSalle Mountains in the distance. It's a perfect end to an absolutely adventurous day. Just kind of hang on for dear life and hope my husband can drive good enough. <laughs> Hell's Revenge and is a Jeep trail you won't forget and one you've got to experience for yourself. Come and ride with me anytime. <laughs>